puffs of smoke, green light. Oh, a boat, of course. This sounds dramatic, and it is. We're traveling through time. I've always wanted to hop in a time machine, but I have to admit that since childhood, I've wanted to use it to visit ancient Egypt. This particular time machine is not suitable for children, nor will it take you to ancient Egypt. This time machine is dedicated to a single purpose, making 20-year-old aged booze in just six days. And this episode is all about time. You're listening to Gastropod, the podcast that looks at food through the lens of science and history. I'm Cynthia Graber. And I'm Nicola Twilley. And this episode, we decided to visit a time machine because we had some questions about time. Why does whiskey take decades to reach perfection? And can that time actually be reduced to less than a week? The more time we spent thinking about time, the more we realized that time plays a role in everything we eat and drink, and in ways that we didn't necessarily expect. Like fish? Why does fish cook so quickly? And what is the, quote, wasabi window? And why should you go against all your instincts and not eat cheese right out of the fridge? Why should you wait? Or to the point, how can you wait? But yes, this episode, we have answers to all of these mysteries, plus, as we said, a time machine. But first... Bob's Red Mill sells the very best nutritional grains and has an extensive library of recipes on their site at bobsredmill.com. You're bound to find something to inspire you at bobsredmill.com, like strawberry shortcake, coconut hazelnut shrimp with grilled peach salsa, blueberry almond donuts, and more. Check out all their recipes at bobsredmill.com. That's bobsredmill.com. Sweet tango apples are back in season. If you haven't tried a sweet tango yet, you're in for a treat. Each loud, crunchy bite releases a fresh burst of juice and a sweet, tangy flavor touched with citrus, honey, and spice. Taste for yourself and see why this best-selling apple has fans that eagerly await its return every fall. Find a grocer near you at sweettango.com slash gastropod. Maybe you would like to come to a gastropod live show with special guests and interactive tastings and us in the actual flesh. If so, and if you're in or near Philly, you're in luck. We're performing at the Franklin Institute on November 16th. Links to the ticket page on our website. Get yours now because our shows do tend to sell out. And even sooner, this very Saturday, we're performing live in Madison, Wisconsin on October 13th. Come say hi and tell all your friends. And finally, we have arranged a special giveaway just for Gastropod listeners, a brand new book all about beer. Right now is the best time ever to be a beer drinker. There are more breweries in the world than ever before. However, beer drinkers are also faced with a deluge of confusing information, and the industry itself is suffering from growing pains, including problems like unequal access to taps and sexism. Drink Beer, Think Beer by John Hall provides a complete guide to beer today, allowing readers to think critically about the best beverage in the world. We have five copies of Drink Beer, Think Beer to give away to our listeners in North America. Email us at contact at gastropod.com with your mailing address by October 23rd for your chance to win one. But don't email us after October 23rd because you will definitely not be a lucky winner. Include your address and make sure your email to contact at gastropod.com reaches us by October 23rd for a chance to win. We promise to take you in a whiskey time machine. But before we get there, we wanted to explore the idea of time a little bit more. Because this episode was actually inspired by a brand new book all about time and food. It's called The Missing Ingredient, The Curious Role of Time in Food and Flavor, and it's by a British food writer called Jenny Linford. I'm quite a light sleeper. You know, often wake up like four or five in the morning. Jenny organizes food events in London, and so one night she was lying in bed and her mind was spinning about work, as mine often does too, and she came up with a new idea for an event. And I thought, could I take people on a journey through time using food? And then I literally was lying there half asleep, sort of thinking thoughts. And I thought, time. But but time is an ingredient. I had this sort of incredible epiphany and I got really excited and sort of sat up in bed. But unlike many of my seemingly brilliant middle-of-the-night epiphanies, Jenny's idea survived into the grim light of day. And then, some time later, it turned into a book. Obviously, I first thought about it as, as something like cooking. I thought of how I use time when I cook. That was the obvious one, but as Jenny started to think of time as an ingredient, she realized it's much more interesting and much more complex than just cooking. And it's actually the making of food involves time. And it's a very multifaceted thing. You know, things like ripeness and freshness uh, and seasonality are about time. The more Jenny thought about it, everything food-related also had to do with time. 
So then she had a problem. How to squeeze all of this into a book? So Jenny decided to break it down, somewhat logically, by time. I mean, I begin with seconds. And seconds is a short section, which seems very appropriate. Short, sharp, and to the point. Like an espresso. Coffee is an interesting example of how a beverage was speeded up. Usually you make coffee by letting water drip through ground coffee beans, or maybe you use some device to push that water through the ground beans. Either way, it takes a few minutes to brew. And then with the discovery of steam power, people in the 19th century are trying to use steam power to make coffee faster. The Italians led the charge in this effort to speed up coffee. The first patent for a steam-brewed coffee machine was issued in 1884, but the term espresso wasn't coined until 1906. Two inventors launched their brand new espresso machine at the Milan Fair that year. It was called the Ideale, and it did just what they wanted it to. It used steam power to push water and steam quickly through ground coffee. They called the resulting brew Café Espresso, meaning literally express coffee. And they do manage to make coffee faster, but it's just really thin and bitter and sort of unpleasant. The pressure was too low and the temperature was too high to extract any of the flavor notes or the nuance of coffee beans. The major breakthrough came a few decades later by a man named Achille Gaggia. And he invents a way of making coffee using steam in 1938, which uses a piston which forces that sort of leverage, allows the steam to be forced through the very finely ground coffee. And that is what makes the espresso coffee, which is what we know as now. And in fact, it is this dude's name, Gaggia, that you still see today on lots of high-end espresso makers. But think about the timing of his invention. His coffee might have been express, but the timing of the launch was kind of off. 1938, World War II is just about to break out. So it's really after the war that then he starts promoting and it spreads. And and it's in the early 1950s in London that we have our first espresso bar opens in Soho. Opened by Gina Lolla Brigida. A super sexy, super famous Italian actress of the era. She literally starred in a movie called The Most Beautiful Woman in the World, playing the role of the most beautiful woman in the world. And it becomes very sort of glamorous and hipster of that time to go and sit and drink. Can you imagine, you know, a small bitter shot of espresso if you've never really had a proper coffee before? And then your first coffee is an espresso. You know, you have to be pretty sophisticated. Sophisticated in that European way where death and despair are also sexy. So you sit there in your black jumpers. I was told by an old coffee seller in that area in Soho, he said, oh, Jenny, there used to be a bar called the Macabre. And you went in and all the waiters wore black. And then when you got your coffee, you you sat and drank it at a coffin because that's how sort of bleak and existentialist it was to have coffee. Of course, today espresso is, yeah, sure, it's sophisticated. You can get all sorts of beautifully crafted drinks, but it's also the coffee you get on the fly. Now, unlike in the past, it takes almost no time to get a good cup of coffee. Yeah, 30 seconds, which is quite remarkable. And really interesting, you know, with our massive coffee culture that we have, and the heart of it is the espresso because that way of making coffee... Using that power of steam allowed you to make a very strong, concentrated shot of coffee that could then be effectively diluted with milk but still taste of coffee. This express coffee, it launched us on a journey towards today's pumpkin spice lattes and cappuccinos. But the clock is ticking. Two espressos adds up to a minute, which is the next section of Jenny's book. It's a little bit chunkier than her section on seconds. Lots and lots of things take minutes, because partly because we have 60 minutes in an hour, and that's a long time. Each section in the book, like seconds and minutes, it's a collection of stories about different foods and drinks. And there's one food Jenny put in minutes that surprised me. I thought it should have gone in seconds. It's savory the taste and flavors of chocolate. One of the qualities of, of eating chocolate is that it melts with the con- you know, at our body temperature. It's that sensual contact within seconds. But the savory I put in minutes because I wanted people to take to think about savoring taking longer than you know, take some minutes, you know, savor your food. So chocolate melts in seconds, but you're supposed to keep the chocolate in your mouth for a whole minute? I mean, come on. I can practically eat a whole bar in a minute. I have a really hard time imagining leaving chocolate in my mouth for an entire minute. But this is what Jenny recommends. What was quite fun to do is to take two bits of the same chocolate, same good chocolate, let one melt in your mouth, think about what flavors you're getting as it melts. 
if you take the same bit of chocolate and you eat it really quickly, it's much more limited. I've certainly had moments where I just needed chocolate fast and I didn't exactly linger over what notes I was picking up. But Jenny's right. It is a totally different experience to slow down. You taste so many more flavors in the chocolate. It is genuinely a much richer experience. And there's actually a scientific reason for that. It's all to do with the time it takes for the cacao butter in the chocolate to melt. When the cacao butter melts, that releases those flavors in your mouth and then allows you to perceive them. Whereas if you just eat it and you don't really let the cacao butter melt, you just don't get it, you know. So it's really, it's really worth, worth doing. Jenny's point is you're literally cheating yourself of chocolate's full flavor if you don't take the time to savor it. Because different flavor notes take different amounts of time to register depending on how heavy each particular chemical is. So the taste of one single square of chocolate, it will actually change over the course of a minute. And, you know, you might be getting citrusy notes depending on the cacao or you might be getting, you know, berry notes. On top of that, chocolate will taste more bitter if you eat it quickly. Cocoa fat helps with the tannins in chocolate. And in really good dark chocolate, there are a lot of tannins. If you eat it quickly, your mouth feels kind of dry. It's a little bitter because the fat hasn't melted to balance the tannins. So if you think you don't like dark chocolate, maybe you just need to slow down. It genuinely tastes a lot better if you eat it slowly. Time yourself. I did. And it is all but impossible to make chocolate last a minute, but it's fun trying. So chocolate was a surprise in the minute section, but one of Jenny's other choices made more intuitive sense to us, and that's cooking fish. All the recipes for fish are quick, you know. Am I just thinking why? This is something I'd never really thought of, but there's a surprisingly logical reason why fish cook so fast. It's because they live in water. Which is a supportive medium. And so they're supported, and so their flesh is lighter and less dense, basically. Land animals are working against gravity and have to stay upright. And so all of those animals, including us, we all have lots of cartilage and denser muscles. And it takes a lot of cooking time to break that all down. So fish really are the ultimate fast food. But there's a downside to how fast they cook, too. It makes it remarkably easy to overcook fish. Jenny interviewed a woman named CJ Jackson. CJ runs seafood cooking classes at London's biggest fish market. And she just said, Jenny, everyone is always amazed at how quickly it cooks. CJ said, look, if you're frying a thin fillet of fish, it can be cooked in as little as a minute and then overcooked in a minute and a half. This could be quite anxiety inducing for the home cook. And so the tendency is to just give it a little bit longer, just in case. And then you end up with overcooked, spongy, dry fish. I speak as someone who has made this mistake. She always said, look, you know, it's always, you know, be brave. It's quicker than you think it's going to be. Be brave indeed. It's worth it. Even for a thicker, denser fish that takes many minutes to cook, like salmon, give it an extra couple of minutes and it's just not as good. A little undercooked is way better than overdone. Some fish, of course, isn't cooked at all. That is sushi. And there's an accompaniment to sushi that Jenny also included in her minutes section, which totally surprised me. It was a revelation to me, too. You know that? That little blob of green stuff you get with your sushi? I thought that was wasabi. But it's Japanese horseradish, which is much cheaper. Jenny told us that true wasabi is hard to grow. In Japan, it grows in mountain streams and clear running water. It takes a full 18 months before you can harvest it. All of that made it really expensive. And only high-end Japanese restaurants would have flown the real thing in from Japan. Which means that most of us, including me, have never tasted real wasabi. But Jenny told us that a few years ago, a British watercress farmer decided to try to grow real wasabi. It was a very secret project, which I think they loved doing because it was all top secret and they had codings and everything. Jenny ordered some wasabi from the company and she grated it because you can't get that distinctive wasabi sensation without grating it to break down the cell walls and kick off an enzyme reaction. And she said that the flavor is much more nuanced than that normal green stuff she was used to. It has got that, the heat of wasabi that you might you know, you get from the Japanese horseradish. But it's got, a, it's got a sweetness, a really beautiful sweetness and a very sort of delicate, grassy flavor to it. The reason Jenny included this wasabi story in the minute section of her book is because it's one of the most time-sensitive foods there is. I called it the wasabi window. You grate your fresh wasabi. Nothing happens at first, but within five minutes, as a chemical reaction takes place, five, then after five minutes, you'll start to taste the heat and the, this flavor. I mean, but then it will trail away again. So you've probably got 
sort of 10, 15 minutes to enjoy your fresh wasabi. This is the magical wasabi window. You can't taste anything at first. And then after a few minutes, the fantastic flavor all fades away. Get it while it's hot. Literally. The week after we spoke to Jenny, I was at a restaurant where they advertised fresh wasabi from a New England farmer. I knew I had to enjoy it in about 10 minutes. It gave the whole dish a little extra thrill. I had to savor it while I could before the flavor just disappeared. And yes, it was really tasty. So the wasabi window is just 10 minutes. But as Jenny collected her stories, she found that there's a sort of magic number in food and cooking, which comes up again and again, 30 minutes. This is a number you'll see a lot at the bookstore. Sometimes it seems as though every other cookbook promises recipes that are on the table in 30 minutes or less. That might be a marketing gimmick, but 30 minutes is a really useful block of time when it comes to recipes. Maybe not in the way you'd expect. It has to do with how long you should just let your food be. What I noticed in a lot of recipes is half an hour comes up quite frequently as a sort of useful time for various aspects of food, including resting. When you roast meat, for example, often a good recipe will tell you to let the meat rest for 30 minutes before serving? That is not just to ramp up the anticipation for your delicious roast dinner. It's actually because that time period allows the meat to reabsorb some of the juices it released while it was cooking so that it tastes more succulent. And then 30 minutes is also the period you're told to rest pastry after you've made. And that's to do with allowing the gluten to develop so that when you roll out your pastry, it doesn't crack. So there are different reasons, you know, depending on the food. And then you have this really unlovely expression, de-chilling. De-chilling might not sound lovely, but what it does to cheese is quite lovely indeed. Fridges are not the ideal environment for cheese. They're very dry and very cold, and that makes cheese seize up a little. It gets tough. And then bring it to room temperature, allows it to relax a little bit, so you get more of the texture that the cheesemaker wants you to experience. The texture of cheese improves dramatically if you leave it out of the fridge for half an hour, and so does the flavor. Cold makes it harder to pick up on all the aromas in the cheese, the smells, and those are critical to the flavor. You know, so if you've bought some good cheese and you want to enjoy it, then you should definitely, you know, bring it out of the fridge, you know, half an hour, if not more, depending on the temperature, before you eat it. I believe Jenny to be correct about this, but... This kind of delayed gratification and planning, it's not my strong point. It only really works for me if my partner Tim and I are specifically planning on having cheese for dinner. Then I can remember to take it out early and fully enjoy cheese's wonderful cheesiness. Otherwise, straight out of the fridge. De-chilling cheese for 30 minutes is already difficult, at least for us. But some foods demand yet more patience. Weeks, even. I wrote a chapter called In Defense of Hanging. And that is hanging meat. Meat starts to go bad right away. Microbes love it. Drink. So really, you know, the the sort of safe thing to do would be like, you know, get your meat, you know, kill your animal, eat it at once. But hanging is an interesting process where you're sort of playing with the process of decay. A good butcher can draw out this flirtation with decay over three or four weeks. I visited a hanging room uh, with all these cattle carcasses hanging around me. And it makes you realize the word hanging literally is hanging because the carcass is, is suspended from a from a hook. There are a few things that are going on as the beef hangs. First, as it dries out, it is, of course, losing moisture and losing weight. And then as it dries out, you've also got enzyme reaction in the meat, which is tenderizing it and creating flavors. Hanging beef is a costly process. Meat is sold by weight, and because you've lost a bunch of water, it's now technically worth less. But then you can charge more for the flavor. Normal supermarkets don't do this. It's really specialized. It looks quite daunting. I talked to a young guy who was an Australian butcher, and they don't have this tradition in Australia. And when he first went into it and he saw carcasses hanging, he was really shocked because they're moldy and they look like they're going off. When it comes time to sell the meat, the butchers just trim the mold off, and the beef underneath is delicious. When you eat it, you'll really taste the difference. You know, we'll have a an added savoriness to it. So for the best tasting beef, it seems like you really need to wait a few weeks. But for the best tasting whiskey, you'll have to wait for years. You would think so, Cynthia. But there's an inventor and entrepreneur here in Los Angeles who says he can make 20-year-old scotch whiskey in six days. We are going to reveal the secrets of his time machine next after we tell you about a couple of sponsors this episode. 
Bob's Red Mill is committed to providing people everywhere with the best quality foods available. They don't just sell the very best nutritional grains. They have a massive library of recipes on their site at bobsredmill.com. You're bound to find something to inspire you at bobsredmill.com. They have recipes for appetizers, breads, breakfasts, desserts, dips, pastas, pizzas, smoothies, salads, soups, instant pot, and meatless options. Like coconut apple bread with granulated sugar, brown sugar, and baking powder, all from the mill, or a berry protein smoothie with Bob's hemp protein powder. Hemp is a variety of the cannabis plant species. Yes, the very same plant that can be inhaled to mind-altering effect. There is a key difference, though. Hemp contains almost no THC, which is the main psychoactive compound in marijuana. What it does contain is all of the essential amino acids that the body needs, as well as lots of dietary fiber and iron. Check out bobsredmill.com to explore thousands of new recipes and find your new favorite dish. That's bobsredmill.com. Using thousands of real women's measurements, Third Love designs its bras with breast size and shape in mind so that they'll fit perfectly and feel even better. Now, since adding 24 new sizes, 3rd Love offers the most options of any brand, a total of 70 sizes. Find your fit in 60 seconds online, order, and try on at home with 3rd Love's Fit Finder Quiz. And because 3rd Love guarantees a perfect fit, returns and exchanges are free and easy. 3rd Love offers a full range of underwear, including thongs. If you think about it, a loincloth is basically a thong, which makes it one of the oldest forms of human clothing. But the modern thong made its debut at the 1939 World's Fair in New York when Mayor LaGuardia ordered the city's nude dancers to cover up. So they did as minimally as possible. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now they are offering Gastropod listeners 15% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash gastropod now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash gastropod for 15% off today. We're obviously focusing on time this episode, and whiskey is a great example of how time translates into money. The most beloved whiskeys are usually around 20 years or older, and they can cost from about 100 bucks to even more than 1,000. So welcome to the distillery, Um, or at least the first part of it. This is Brian Davis. He's built a whiskey time machine slash theme park in downtown Los Angeles. But Brian didn't start out as a mad scientist. First, he started off making booze the normal way with his partner, Joanne. Joanne and I had moved to Spain. We'd opened an absinthe distillery when we were psychotic in our 20s. And, uh, and we ended up getting lucky. Very lucky. One of the world's most famous mixologists decided that Brian and Joanne's absinthe was the best. And then the business really sort of took off like crazy. And we ended up with 25 employees and all the stresses and nightmares that go with having 25 employees. And when the absinthe market crashed and we sold it, Joanne and I decided to basically do a retirement project. Brian and Joanne bought some land on an artichoke farm in California. Not most people's first thought when they picture retirement. But they couldn't leave the booze alone. It was the two of us. We were really into Iowa-style whiskeys, and so that's what we decided to, to produce to start. Isla whiskies come from the Scottish island of Isla in the Hebrides, and they're known for their smoky flavor. So Brian and Joanne, they had this great idea. They thought, we'll make whiskey in our retirement home. But then they started running into all sorts of different questions as they thought about all the different steps they'd need to follow to make whiskey. So, okay, how do we sit there and say, you know, we want the this malted barley versus that malted barley? How do we know if we want it to be malted for a longer period of time where the seeds are more mature before you dry them? Where should your peat come from? What kind of wood do you want to use for your barrels? There's like 10 different variables in here that all had to be dialed in and, and orchestrated together for each individual different product offering. And so distilleries in the whiskey space traditionally have spent hundreds of years doing exactly that. Even if Brian and Joanne did make a decision or 12, it would take a decade to find out if they'd bet correctly, because that's kind of the minimum amount of time needed to age your whiskey. Brian realized he needed a way to peek into the future to make sure he wasn't spending a fortune and 20 years of his life aging a whiskey that was going to taste like crap. I was trying to develop a process that would give me a rough sketch so that I could then traditionally fill barrels. People have, in fact, tried to make these types of whiskey time machines before. The basic idea is that people already knew that much of the flavor of whiskey is created by the wood in the barrels breaking down over time and reacting with the alcohol. So they tried to get the wood to break down faster and not take a decade to react with the alcohol. 
And so Brian decided to try some of these existing time machines to see if they work. Each of the ones he tried used a slightly different, equally out there technique to break up the wood super fast and mix it with the whiskey, like putting it under super high pressure. You know, what happens if we turn it up to 10,000 PSI and break the wood apart that way? What happens if we vibrate it? What happens if we put it on a, there's a patent for putting it on a gondola and running it up to the top of a mountain and then back down and it would just go endlessly in a loop on a ski lift. Those didn't work. Then Brian tried just soaking lots of little chips of wood in whiskey like a tea bag. That didn't work either. And then inspiration struck. So I was standing on my deck and I had this old deck made of reclaimed wood I had gotten from a friend who was the manager of the dump. And I needed to put a new uh, layer of paint on it to protect it from the sun because it was falling apart in the sun. So Brian made a mental note to add painting the deck to his to-do list, and then he carried on with his day. And so I got about maybe 100 feet away and then went like, hey, wait a minute. Okay, if the deck is falling apart in the sun, that means the polymer structures are degrading in the light. Brian thought maybe he could mimic that process. Maybe he could find a way to expose wood to the equivalent of incredibly strong sunlight so that it would break down like his deck did. And this idea worked. That moment of inspiration on his deck, that was in 2009, so obviously this whole process took a few years to perfect. But Brian patented his time machine in 2015, and now his distillery is up and running in a big building in downtown L.A. It's called Lost Spirits. You guys ready to go to Whiskey Island? Yes. All right, cool. This way, guys. So, off we go. Some of you will have no doubt done a distillery tour before. This is not like them. I worked in theme park design out of college for about a year. Uh, Not very long, but I love doing it. Brian has set up his stills and his time machine and his lab inside a completely fantastical, Disneyfied world. To get to Whiskey Island, we had to go through a jungle, ride a pirate ship along a river, and then get on a carousel under starry skies, surrounded by odd sea creatures. Yeah, no, I painted all the, the fish faces and... Uh, the creatures in here and the carousel benches. Yes, this is not the usual distillery tour. And then Brian pointed out a special item he has in his lab next door. Probably the most fun thing that's hiding back here besides some ex- exotic and rare bottles of stuff for study. Uh, but hiding back there is the first edition of The Time Machine. That's H.G. Wells' famous book, The Time Machine. And then we got to see Brian's time machine. It's a glass tube that's about maybe 14 inches around. Uh, that's full of, uh, in this case, whiskey, I believe, at the moment. And then it's got these this grid-like stainless steel baskets inside that are holding all the wood up against the glass. The stainless steel baskets look like the ones you might dip into a deep fryer, and they've got wood chips suspended in bubbling whiskey instead of bubbling oil. Uh, and then it's got a whole bunch of arrays of really, really, really bright, intense lights that are aimed at it. Uh, and then shields to keep the light out of your eyes. The lights are three times as powerful as sunlight at the equator. That's intense. And that makes the wood disintegrate into the alcohol. Instead of a barrel breaking down slowly over decades, the lights are powerful enough to cause the same amount of disintegration in six days. And that is why those earlier whiskey time machine ideas didn't work. They just tried to increase the surface area of the wood whiskey interface. But it turns out that more wood is not the same as old wood. In other words, what you get out of the wood as it degrades in year one are completely different chemical products than what you get out of the wood in year 15. Brian's sunlight process compresses that multi-year time frame into just a few days. So that's one problem Brian solved. But he wasn't done because when the wood first degrades, it doesn't taste so great. So there's two main polymers we care about. Uh, Lignin is the hard, brittle polymer that makes the tree able to stand up straight. And then hemocellulose is the polymer that makes them soft and spongy and lets them bend in the wind and not snap apart. The lignin breaks down into compounds that taste like plastic and rubber and tar. And meanwhile, the hemicellulose is breaking down into equally undelicious things that smell like vomit and rancid orange juice. These are not flavors I want in my whiskey. And that's okay because there's another step. It's called esterification, and basically what happens is the gross-smelling chemicals from the decomposing wood bind to the alcohol molecules and make new chemicals that taste much better. They turn into flavors like honeysuckle and leather and pipe tobacco and vanilla. Uh, Now imagine there's hundreds of different combinations that they're in taking place, and you get all the complexity that makes old booze old booze. And so just like people thought that soaking wood chips in booze would speed up the aging process, and they were wrong, people also thought that you could 
couldn't make the esterification process happen more quickly. They thought it just took time for all those chemicals to interact and react and create delicious flavors. Chemists and whiskey makers believed that these reactions just happened over the course of years, whereas in reality, it was a chemical a catalyst that was making them all happen. People had thought that time was the only catalyst, but Brian discovered that the wood sheds a catalyst as it breaks down. He's proven that it's there, though he hasn't been able to isolate it yet. Brian is still working on identifying this mysterious catalyst that the wood naturally gives off because he wants to name it after himself. But meanwhile, now that he's figured out how this reaction happens, he's built the second part of his time machine. He's proven everyone wrong again. You can speed up this whole esterification process. Amazing. But our whiskey is not done yet. Once you're to about 15 to 20 years in a barrel, there's really no new chemistry taking place anymore. Uh, But as the ethanol and water evaporate through the barrel walls, they make the flavors more and more concentrated over time. And so we wanted to figure out how to recreate that concentration. This is what is poetically known as the angel's share, because monks who were distilling in the Middle Ages didn't understand pores in wood or evaporation. They just knew some of their whiskey disappeared. The monks studied the phenomenon for a long time, and they ultimately concluded that the angels would come in in the night And they would have a drink, and then they would bless the barrel in exchange. This angel's share is the third step in any good whiskey time machine. You have to evaporate a little of the whiskey. But this evaporation process is not as simple as just maybe heating up your whiskey a little bit and letting some evaporate. Different chemicals evaporate at different temperatures over different time scales. Brian hasn't quite been able to mimic that part of aging, the final step to make a 30-year-old whiskey in six days. Essentially, that machine's recreating that effect. And it doesn't work all the time, and we don't really understand why. So it's not quite there yet. And in fact, this three-step whiskey time machine... Brian makes it sound like it was just the eureka moment on his deck, but really, it took quite a bit of tinkering to make it work. When I first came up with the idea of using the light to degrade the wood, I was able to get something that had all of the right composition of an aged bottle of booze in terms of its total compounds, but all of the ratios were batshit crazy. Like, nothing was right. Brian didn't really care at first, because he was like, okay, it's weird, but it still tastes pretty good. But he's a Scotch whiskey obsessive at heart, and he couldn't let it go. But then we spent the next, uh, well, I spent the next maybe year and a half doing nothing but trying to fine-tune that process. So changing bands of light, changing relative concentrations of different bands of light in the process, changing intensities, changing, you know, wood treatments, different strategies for toasting or charring, like going through all sorts of different possible strategies to try to tweak which polymer degrades first and in what concentrations in order to rebalance it. I find Brian's time machine building process insanely fascinating, of course. But what I really want to know is, can he successfully replicate aged booze? He uses his time machine to make all sorts of aged liquors, rums and brandies, and of course, whiskey. Does it work? In the rums, we've actually published the chromatograms and published the overlays and comparisons. A chromatogram is a readout from a machine that tells you exactly which chemicals and how much of each of them is in your sample. And we've been able to almost identically recreate the uh, the chemical signature of, uh, I use 1975 Port Morant as my control sample. This is a very expensive high-end rum from Guyana. It's super rare and can cost hundreds of dollars. And we've gotten very, very close to recreating its chemical signature, uh, albeit at a lower density, which is why we have a 15 to 20-year-old signature, as opposed to the 33-year-old signature, which is what I really, really, really want to figure out how to make someday. Basically, Brian is saying he can make 20-year-old rum in six days that is more or less identical chemically to the real deal. But Brian won't even admit whether or not he's tested whiskey with a chromatogram. The reason we've never published that kind of data in whiskey is because you're really touching on people's most deeply held belief systems, and we try to be... um, you know, respectful and reverent to the fact that this is really a religion for a lot of people as opposed to a beverage. And whiskey lovers don't want you to mess with their religion. And so it's really a little bit different than when you're making rum or brandy, which are really beverages. When you get into whiskey, it's, you know, it's more special, I suppose. And so we take a more humble approach to to talking about it. You want to say it tastes good. You want to say it's interesting. You want to talk about the production process, but you don't necessarily want to go like, this is the equivalent of X number of years. Um, I mean, if I had to do it, Malt Advocate magazine pegged it at about 10 to 12 years old. And so I could let Malt Advocate magazine do the talking for me, I suppose. So bottom line, and apologies to members of the cult of whiskey, but the answer to your question, Cynthia, is 
yes, Brian really can make a 10 to 12 year old aged whiskey in six days. Let's go back to the rum example. Brian can create a rum that's basically identical to a 15 to 20 year old rum, but he can't yet match the 33 year old one. He has the same problem with whiskey because he hasn't figured out that angel share issue, as we mentioned before. Which is why those bottles of, you know, old Villiers independent bottlings of, of ancient rums and whiskeys, uh, why I still spend hundreds of dollars on them. <laughs> <laughs> Brian still feels like he has work to do. But whiskey lovers in general have been pretty enthusiastic about Brian's time machine bottlings. He's already released two whiskeys. So far, we generally get treated pretty well by everybody by virtue of coming from the point of view of having been priests before heretics. And it's one of so much of neat international awards and stuff, too. This is great, but we wondered if Brian can look at a chart and see what chemicals match in his booze and the aged one, couldn't you just buy the chemicals and mix them together and get the aged whiskey that way without the hassle of building a time machine? It's such a great question, right? And the, uh, the answer is that there's literally like hundreds and hundreds of things that get formed throughout the process. And many, many, many of those things, literally, we don't have a way to make it in a laboratory. Turns out it's actually easier to invent a time machine than to figure out how to synthesize all of these chemicals. Uh, much easier. <laughs> And now that Brian's invented a booze time machine, are all the big liquor companies freaking out about the small upstart who's going to disrupt their entire business model? You would think. Um, and, and it first instinctive knee-jerk response would be to go where you just went there. In reality, it's not quite like that. Brian's time machine whiskey is not about to wipe out this entire super profitable industry for a few reasons. For one, Brian just can't make as much booze as all those big companies do. Plus, each one of his machines costs about $100,000 to build. And I mean, we couldn't make enough hardware to be, you know, 2% of the market um, in our lifetimes. <laughs> <laughs> right. So at the end, a bottle of Brian's booze costs about the same to make as a bottle of a decent 15-year-old aged variety you can pick up at the liquor store. So why bother? The real advantage comes from the fact that I'm able to compete uh, where I would never be able to if I had to do this the conventional way. Um, like I would never have been able to build up the business to the point where I could take all of the failed batches and throw them away. And so what the technology really did for me was make it possible um, for me to compete in a way that I would have just simply had to, have, I would have been forced and left no recourse but to make a vodka or something. This is actually what new distillers usually do. They make vodka or gin at first, which is basically flavored vodka, because they have no way to get into any other type of booze at the beginning. It takes too long. It turns out that the time machine's advantage is not primarily economic. It's that it gives you time to fail. Well, and the time gives me the ability to iterate. Uh, right, It gives you the ability to R&D and to develop products that you feel comfortable uh, putting on the shelf much more rapidly. So the truth is the time advantage, its biggest single impact is the speed of research and development. And in fact, Brian couldn't share all the details about this because it's top secret business stuff. But he admitted he's working with major liquor companies. Diageo and Suntory and the big booze conglomerates, they don't see Brian's technology as a rival. They see it as a tool. They can do their R&D that way, too. Brian has an entire other, much bigger distillery where he's working with those big brands on commercial products. He uses the little distillery in downtown L.A. as a playground for his own ideas. Right now, Brian's perfecting a new drink. It's sort of like a Slivovitz, a plum brandy that turns dark and dense and rich after being aged for years. I'll probably finish it in, like, a month and then have it done before Halloween. Halloween 2018 instead of Halloween 2028. And these experiments, it's not just that Brian can go through and find something that works quickly. It's also that he can try entirely new things, things that aren't possible using the old school barrel aging method. And that means he can create entirely new flavors. Whiskey is aged in all sorts of barrels. Some are brand new. Some have been used to age other alcohols like wine. Putting whiskey in a used barrel gives the final product an extra layer of flavor. Wood needs to be prepped for Brian's time machine aging process, and usually Brian would use water to get the wood ready. But for one of his whiskeys, he decided to use late harvest Riesling wine to prep the wood. And that sort of has a really particularly fun reason for existing because a late harvest Riesling wine isn't actually aged in barrels. You literally can't taste Isla whiskey aged in late harvest Riesling barrels any other way. 
And those Riesling grapes give it a lovely apricot, almost marmalade note that I haven't tasted in other aged whiskeys. That's one type of experimentation. And Brian also wants to play around with the wood itself, because out in the world, only three species of oak are used to make barrels. But there are lots more oak species. They're just too porous or too naughty to make barrels. But that doesn't matter for Brian's time machine, because you don't actually have to build a barrel. Uh, So African blue oak sounds really interesting, you know? I have no idea what that's going to do, but I mean, I really want to try it. Uh, California black oak was a food supply for Native Americans. That sounds interesting. Brian wants to not only be a time traveler, but also a flavor magician. Which is so funny. What I ended up thinking is so exciting about what Brian is doing is completely not what I expected. I thought he was speeding up time just to make money. But actually, it's a much more interesting thing. It's about manipulating time to explore flavor. Part of why he can do that is he's actually an expert on flavor in this particular field of aged booze. And this goes back to what Jenny was talking about in her research on time for her book. The whole point of using and manipulating time is to get just the flavors that you want. Exactly. And what's funny is that all the chefs and farmers and cheesemongers and butchers that Jenny writes about in her book, they all prove this larger point which is that getting to where you have the skill to create those magical flavors, that also requires, of course, time. I think one of the themes in the book is, you know, you can't beat experience, and experience takes time. Brian had been making booze for years and drinking it for even longer. This experience is just what gave him the expertise he needed to play with time. You know, when I talk to the food producers, their knowledge was acquired over years. And actually, you know, I learned how to cook over years because it's when you do it and you do something over and over again that then you you become familiar with it and you learn it and you understand it and your senses are telling you, you know, this is smelling good, this isn't quite right. In the end, it's not about fast or slow. It's about taking the right amount of time. Listen through to the end for a sneak peek at our next episode. We are finally taking on one of your most requested topics. And don't forget to come see us in Madison this weekend or Philly in November. We love getting to say hi in person. Thanks this episode to Jenny Linford. Her new book is called The Missing Ingredient, and we have a link to it on our website. And we also owe a huge thanks to Tom Gilliford, who hooked us up with a recording booth in London. He's a gastropod fan, but also a Great British Bake Off star. And we're huge fans of the Great British Bake Off, so we were thrilled. Thanks also to Brian Davis and his partner, Joanne. Lost Spirits whiskeys and rums are available at liquor stores around the country. And if you're in L.A., you have to take their distillery tour. It's unlike any other liquor tour you will ever have been on. We have photos of his time machine on our website and in our listener email. Sign up at gastropod.com. Third Love is passionate about the perfect fit, and they believe it's time for your bra to fit you, not the other way around. Their collections are designed by women for women, and so you will love the way you feel under each and every look. And now they offer over 70 sizes and more than a dozen styles, so you'll find the perfect bra for every moment and every outfit. Get 15% off your first purchase by going to thirdlove.com gastropod today. I'm a biologist. I like uh, biological puzzles. In this particular instance, I wasn't bothered whether this research uh, had any kind of real value other than trying to inspire people about the wonder of birds. And, you know, a bird's egg is the most perfect thing. It is the most remarkable product of evolution.